Today we're going to learn loop analysis. So the module objective for today that is uh, to employ KVL to perform a loop analysis to determine all loop currents in a network. And after you get a loop current, and you can get everything from a circuit. It's very similar to node analysis. In node analysis, where at line you can get nodal voltages, you can solve everything in the circuit. And here, if you can determine all the loop current, then you can solve everything in the circuit. And then on top of that, we're going to help you to find out which will be the easier method to choose. So loop analysis is the second systematic technique to determine all the current and all voltages in a circuit. And how it works. So we're going to determine all the loop current in the circuit. We are going to talk about uh, the definition of loop current shortly in the next slides. And at the same time, the second question is, how do we choose nodal and loop analysis? So the rule of thumb to decide is to pick the one that have less equations. So you don't want to have many uh, equations to solve all together. So let's look at this simple example. This is called a single loop circuit. The first question is, how many nodes do we have in this circuit? One. Ready? Sent. So we have a student picking zero from zero all the way to five. Uh, so it looks like we need to review the definition of uh, Rudy is very confident. He said four. <laughs> so let's see how many nodes we have. Nodes is the definition of be the junction between elements. So we have two elements over here, so it means there is one node here, right? That is the junction between the two. And similarly, between these two elements, there is one node. I will put a, like a node B over here. I have two nodes already. Between these two, there is one node, right? So that's a three. Between these two, there is one node four. Between these two, there is one node. That's a five. So that's a five nodes in the problem. So how many loops? Let's get it ready. How many loops in the problem? All right, send the answer. So in this problem, there is only one loop. The loop is a closed path that never goes through any element twice. If I start from here, say I follow this, and until I come back to my starting point, so that will be a closed path. There is only one closed path. Some students have like two, they think that I can go from here going the other way around and come back. So, but this is the same loop. So the reason that when we draw the loops and we give a direction, that is to help us to write the KVL equations. The best way of telling other people like how you write your equation by, by counting the voltage drop following the loop. But that is the same loop. So there's a one loop in the problem. And the next question is, if I maximize the utilization of uh, the giving information in the circuit, so you are giving me 12, giving me 18, and how many equations do I have in node analysis? If I use the node analysis to find uh, everything in the problem, how many equations do we have? All right, send your answer, let me take a look. Half student said uh, five, and uh, the other half said three. So let's take a look at this. So we have five nodes. If we assume that we know nothing from this problem, and also remember, we need to select a reference node. If you select the right reference node, all the other nodes will be compared to this reference node. So it means that you have four unknowns. So that means that you have at most four equations. But at the same time, there are two given information. So it means there are two constraints in the problem. Two given information, they are independent. So if we work on the problem by using the method that we taught, and you will have two equations, right? That's how we find equations. Because we select one reference, so there's a like number of nodes minus one that is the left over. And at the same time, this problem gives us two information. So it means that we are going to have two equations. And since this problem only have one loop, it implies that if we use loop analysis, we only have one equation about the loop current. So in this case, we'll choose loop analysis to solve this problem instead of nodal analysis. Let's have a quick review about uh, the basic definitions. And in a circuit, we know that each component, for example, this component can be a resistor, can be a voltage source, can be current source, can be dependent sources, right? Each component is characterized by its voltage across and its current going through it. 
and a loop is a closed pass that does not go twice over any node. A mesh is a special loop that does not enclose any other loops. So for example, over here, if I draw a loop, inside of this loop, there is no other loops. So this special loop is also a mesh. And here you have a, another mesh. And this can be, if I draw a loop like that, this can be a loop, but it's no longer a mesh because this loop contains the other two smaller loops. So that is the definition and the difference between a loop and a mesh. A loop current is a fixtures current that is assumed to flow around a loop. Here I have one loop, and here I have another loop, but we assume that I have a different loop current. And a mesh current is a loop current that is associated with a mesh. For example, here I1, that is a mesh current. And this mesh current is associated with this mesh. Goes through 1, 2, 7, 6, come back to 1. And I2, that is another mesh current. And I3 is a loop current. And a current through any component that can be pressed in terms of loop currents. And over here, Take element 7 for example. For this mesh, the mesh current going through element 7, that is I1. For this mesh, the element goes through the mesh current going through this mesh, that is I2. So we know that the actual current going through element 7, that is a combination of I1 and I2. And since I1 and I2, they are in opposite directions. And the current goes through element 7, if I define the reference direction going downward, it will be I1 minus I2. And not every loop current is required to compute or current through com components. A minimum set of a loop current is a collection of the minimum number of loop currents that are necessary to compute every current in a circuit. So then you might want to see how do we know the minimum set? A minimum set for a given circuit depends on the number of branches and the number of nodes. So which is calculated by using the number of branches minus the number of nodes minus one. In majority of the time, you don't really need to use this equation to help you to find out what is the minimum set. It's always a good idea to start from the mesh current. Then I will start by looking at the problem how many meshes I have. That's good enough to tell you how many mesh equations that you will need. Let's take a look at this problem. This problem, we have uh, seven branches. Let's see what are the seven branches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven branches. And we have uh, six nodes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six nodes. So seven minus six minus one, that is equal to two. So it implies that there is a minimum two mesh current that we need to solve this problem. So it's a pretty clear that we have two meshes so we just define these two mesh currents that will be enough for us to solve this problem. And how do we solve problems by using loop analysis? So the first step to draw the mesh current, and sometimes the mesh current is not enough. In that case, you will need to draw loop current. So this is why I like in, in the practice or uh, in the examples, when you see me working on the problem, I normally already say first step, draw loop currents. So after you get these loop currents or mesh currents, the second step, you can write the mesh equations by using KVL. If I write the KVL equation for the first mesh, basically we use the mesh current to calculate the voltage drop. Uh, following this direction, the voltage drop on the first element is uh, I1 times R1. The voltage drop on the second element, that is I1 minus I2 times R3, because the current going through R3 from top downward, that is equal to I1 minus I2. And the voltage drop on this R2 resistor, that is I1 times R2, the voltage drop from F to A, that is a minus Vs. So that is how we find the first mesh equation. And similarly, we can work on the second equation. To write the, the second mesh equation, if we start from here, the voltage drop on this R4 resistor, that is I2 times R4. Voltage drop on R5, that is I2 times R5, which becomes I2 times R4 plus R5. The voltage drop on this R3 resistor, 
that is a uh, I2 because uh, this is the direction that I'm following. So this is why I2 is already positive. And it's a share, this resistor is a share between with I1. So I1 is going in the reverse direction of I2. I2 is going upward in this branch, but I1 is going downward in this branch. So this is why we use I2 minus I1 times R3. And the voltage drop on here on this branch, that is a VS2 plus VS2 that is equal to zero. So this is how we find the mesh equation or loop equations. After we get these loop equations, the next step is to solve them. The final step is to draw the conclusion. So there are several different cases that uh, will allow us to perform a loop analysis. The first case, circuits with voltage sources. This is a problem, and this problem only have voltage sources. And in this case, we can do model by inspection as well. So before we do model by inspection, let's write the equations using the traditional way, how we write the KVL equations. So the KVL equation for the first mesh, which is a uh, 6 times I1 plus 6 times I1 minus I2, which give us 6 plus 6, 6 plus 6 times I1 minus 6 times I2, 12 I1 minus 6 I2, that is equal to 12. We notice that the coefficient for I1 is simply the summation of all the resistance in the mesh. So 6 plus 6, 12. And also the coefficient for I2 in the first equation is uh, the resistance shared by mesh 1 and mesh 2 with a negative sign. And if we write the second loop equation, we have a 3 times I2 plus 6 times I2 minus 6 times I1 plus 3, that is equal to 0. So we find it that the coefficient for I1, which is a negative 6, which is the same as the coefficient for I2 in the first equation. And the coefficient for I2 becomes 3 plus 6, that is 9. So that is simply the summation of all the resistance in the second mesh. Since we are counting the voltage drop in the equation, and if we have a voltage source over here, and if it's a voltage drop, it will be a positive on the least side. And if we move it to the other hand side, it becomes the voltage increase. So let's take a look at that. For the first mesh, by following the direction of this mesh current, we see a voltage increase of 12. Following this direction from downward upward, that is the increase of 12. This is why we have positive 12. And for the second mesh, by following this direction, there is a voltage drop. This is why we have a negative 3. So we can further put this into the meshes form. And for the second example, where we have a three meshes, one mesh, two mesh, three mesh. And also, it's better for us to define the mesh current falling in the same direction. If it's falling in the clockwise direction, we define all the current falling in the clockwise direction. And if you define a falling counterclockwise direction, you define all of them falling in the counterclockwise direction. That is just a recommendation. You don't have to do that, but doing that allows you to do model by inspection. If you don't do that, you cannot do model by inspection. You will very likely that you will end up with the wrong solution. For this example, if we write all three loop equations, we know that for the first loop, the coefficient for I1, that is the summation of all the resistance in this mesh, right? 4 plus 6. And the coefficient for I2, because there's uh, no resistor shared between mesh 1 and mesh 2. This is why it's a 0. And it always have a minus sign. And uh, the coefficient of I3, that is a shared resistance between mesh 1 and 3. So we, this is why it's a uh, negative 6. It always have a negative sign for these off-diagonal entities in the matrix form. For the second loop, the coefficient for I2, that is summation of all the resistance in this network, which is a 9 plus 3. And the shear resistance between mesh 2 and 3, that is a, this is 3k resistor. So this is why we have a negative 3 as a coefficient for I3. If we put this into a metric form, this will be symmetric. So we don't need to talk about this too. And the last entity in this matrix, that is the coefficient for I3, which is a summation for 
the resistance in this mesh 3, which is a 6 plus 4 plus 3. So this is how we get that. On the right hand side, it represents the voltage increase in the corresponding loops. For the first loop, by following the direction, we see a voltage drop of a 6, so which is why we put a negative 6. For the second mesh, by following this direction, we see a voltage increase, which is why we put a 6. And the third one doesn't have a voltage source, this is why it's a 0. So this is how we do model by inspection. And we can put this into a mesh form directly. We write on nodes I1, I2, I3, then put a voltage increase to the right hand side, which is a negative 6, 6, 0. And we write the, either in the mesh form, the diagonal entities are the summation of all the resistance in the corresponding meshes. And the off diagonal entities are the shared resistance between meshes with a negative sign. That is the first case. The second case, the circuits with uh, current sources. For this problem, we have uh, two different meshes, two different uh, mesh currents. And we know that this is good enough to describe the problem. And since this current has to be the current going through this branch, so it tells us that this mesh current is equal to 2 milliamp, right? Because we use um, this I1 to represent the mesh current and the current going through this branch that is 2 milliamp, it implies that I1 is a 2 milliamp. So we see that for the second case, the problem becomes easier. And we can write this equation directly. That will give us I1 is equal to 2 milliamp. The second mesh is a, a typical mesh, and we'll write it by using KVL by counting the voltage drop. So this is negative 2, then plus 6 times I2, plus 2 times I2, minus 2 times I1, that is equal to 0. That is how we write the second mesh equation. Then we'll be able to solve them. After we solve them, then we will find out what the problem is looking for. The problem asks us to find a VO. So VO over here, uh, the current going through this 6K resistor that is uh, met up just using this one mesh current, which is a uh, 3 over 4 milliamp times the resistance 6k that will give us a VO. And if you want to find a V1 in the problem, you have two different ways to do it. You can either use the definition. Say V1 is the voltage drop between this node and the reference node, right? So we can count the voltage drop on this 4k resistor plus voltage drop on this 2k resistor. This is one way to do it. And second way to do it by following this path through this 4k resistor, this 2 volts voltage source then this is 6k resistor, you can find the voltage drop. These are called the first method by using a definition. The second method, you can use a KVL. So if you are looking for the voltage between this node and that node, you draw the loop from here to here and come back to there. That will allow me to write one KVL equation that will help me to solve V1. So either way is fine. Over here we use the definition, V1 that is equal to voltage drop on this 4K plus voltage drop on this 2K resistor. That will give us a 10.5 volt. Third test, we have a current source, but these current sources are shared by loops. So the previous case, this current source is independent, like this one. This is not a shared between meshes, but this current source, 4 milliamp current source, is shared between these two different meshes. And the way to solve this problem, the first step is select the mesh current like what we did, we select this mesh current. If we select the mesh current like that, we know that the current in this branch will be represented by I2 and I3. At the same time, it's a given, it's a 4 milliamp. It implies that we can only write one equation for these two meshes. By having a shared current source in between, it gives us one constraint between I2 and I3. It requires I2 minus I3 has to be equal to 4 milliamp. And I1 over here, that is uh, the same as what we had from the previous case. So I1 has to be equal to 2 milliamp. So it means that uh, this problem, we back to have three equations, but we can only write uh, two equations right now because we have uh, one shared current source. And it implies that we have to find uh, another equation. So we have here we have uh, two different methods to do that. One is called a super mesh method. We assume that uh, this shared current source doesn't exist. It will open 
this piece as a one mesh. If this part doesn't exist, it will open up a mesh, right? So we can write the KVL equation for this super mesh that will give us one equation. We write a KVL equation for this super mesh. Let's do that together. The first, let's start from here. The first voltage drop that is a negative six because this is increased, right? This side is higher than left hand side. So we have negative six plus voltage drop on this one k resistor and the current going through this one k resistor that is a I3 because there is only one mesh current going through there. So that is a one times I3. The voltage drop on this 2k resistor that is a two times the current I2 because there is only one mesh current going through there. The actual current that is equal to I2. And then plus the voltage drop on this 2k resistor which is a 2k times I2 minus I1. And we continue that the last element, the voltage drop on this 1k resistor, that is I3 minus I1 times this 1k. Now we counted all the voltage drops in this loop. So that's how we write this KVL equation. Now we have three equations with the three unknowns. So we'll be able to solve the problem. So the next method is called a general loop method. So just now, before we talk about the problem, and I think like some of you have already found out, we can use any other loop to find out the last equation. So in general loop method, we define the loop current instead of the mesh current. So I will define my loop current in this way. Say I define this I1, no problem, I2, no problem. But because this is shared between I2 and I3, I define a different loop current. I don't define I3 like the previous method anymore. I define I3 differently. You can do it like this. If you define the problem like this, and I2 will become easy. So I2, because there is only one mesh current going through this branch, so I2 that is equal to 4 milliamp, and I1 that is giving 2 milliamp, I2 is 4 milliamp in that case. Now we only need to write the equation for the last loop. The last loop is the same as what we did before, but remember, this current definition are different. So let's write the KVL equation together. So the first voltage drop, which is a negative six. The second voltage drop, which is I3 times 1K. This voltage drop on this 2K resistor that is a I3 going downward plus I2 going downward. Both of them are going downward through this element. So this is why it's a two times I2 plus I3. Now we continue the voltage drop on this resistor that is a I3 plus I2 minus I1 times 2K. Because there are three loop current going through this branch. Now we continue the voltage drop on this resistor that is a I3 minus I1 times this 1K. That is equal to zero. So this is how we find the loop equation. Now you see the difference between the super mesh method and a general loop approach. In the super mesh method, we define the mesh like what we did traditionally. Then we have a constraint equation instead of an independent equation. And in the general loop method, we no longer have that constraint and it makes it easier for us to find one mesh current. That's the difference between the two different methods. Case four, circuits with dependent sources. So when we have dependent sources, over here we have a dependent current source, we have a dependent voltage source, and the way to solve this type of problem is very similar to the way that how we solve problems using node analysis when we had a dependent sources. Over here, we will treat these dependent sources as the independent sources from the beginning to write the mesh equations. So over here we define four different meshes, we write the mesh equations, assume these are independent sources. On top of that, because this source depends on other variables, for example, this one depends on Vx, and this one depends on Ix. In addition to these equations, I need to find the equation to describe these controlling variables in terms of uh, these mesh currents. To find Vx in terms of uh, this mesh current, we need to use the Ohm's law. So Vx is a voltage drop from here to here, which is equal to I3 minus I1, because I1 going to the other direction, times this 2k. So that is Ohm's law, how we write the controlling variable for Vx. And the controlling variable for Ix, 
let's see, ix is the current going through this branch. We know that there are two mesh currents going through this branch. So this is why ix going this direction, that is equal to i4 going through the same direction, minus i2 in the reverse direction. So this is how we find the two additional equations for these controlling variables. Now we have six equations with the six unknowns, we'll be able to solve the problem. So now we learn four different cases to solve problems by using loop analysis.